So now I want to use these new definitions that we've introduced to give an example of a proof and try to emphasize some proof strategy in the sense of how would you come up with such a thing. So a little proof strategy. And the idea that I'm going to try to convey is the interplay between proof and counterexample. Or, you know, more generally, proof and disproof. So the idea is if you have some fact and you don't know if it's true or false, or even if you do know if it's true or false, um, then if you want to try and find a proof or a disproof, then one thing that you can try is to work in both directions and use them to inform the other. So let's say you start by trying to prove something. And then either you, you succeed, it works, then you're done. But if you don't succeed, you should try to think about what it is that is preventing you from proving this. Is there something you don't know? Is there some property that you would need in order to prove this? What is this, you know, what is the roadblock that you're hitting? And then turn that around and say, can I use that roadblock to disprove it? So then you try and disprove it. And maybe that works. But if it doesn't, try and figure out what is getting you stuck here. And then whatever is getting you stuck here, can you take that and use this to prove it? So I think I want to do two examples. Okay, and the, you know, that's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing I want to say is that having a good store of examples to draw from and to test uh, should often give you insight into whether things are true or false. So let's just start off with some examples. So prove or disprove. Let's say we have functions f from a to b and g from b to c. So we can define their composition. If f and g are both surjective, then the composition, g follows f, is surjective. Is this true? Can we prove this? Or can we disprove it? So let's start by just writing down some examples. Remember that we have this you know, easy diagram form to write examples down in. So if we just start with some sets A, B, C, which we give some number of elements, and we just, OK, so this function needs to be surjective. So we get that, whatever, something like this. This function needs to be subjective. And then if we look at the composition, what is that looking like? Um, this guy goes here. This guy goes here. This guy goes here. And this guy, uh, yes. Did I do that one? Yeah, OK, there. And then this guy goes there. So this is the composition. Looks like it's also surjective. So it checks out in this case. Of course, that's not a proof. But in this example, it checks out. That's some evidence. So I kind of want to write down another example. But I can't really think of anything that I would do differently. So I am gonna, I'm going to say, let's just try and prove it. Let's see if that works. So let's try and prove it. So 
So let's remember the definitions. Because remember, what are the things that I emphasized already about, about proof strategy? Start from the definitions. And think about what tools you have to work with. So definitions. A function is surjective if for all elements of the codomain, there is an element of the domain that maps to it. OK. And so what tools do we have? So what are we given in the statement of this problem? So we have this setup where f and g are these functions. And we know that f and g are surjective. So this is the main thing we're given to work with. So let's write down what this means. Um, F and G are surjective, i.e. Um, let me just do the shorthand. For all B and B exists A and A, such that F of A equals B. And for all C and C, that's that's f being surjective. And what does it mean for g to be surjective? For all c and c exists b and b, such that g of b equals c. So just thinking about this a little bit more, um, a little bit more broadly, this gives us a way to go from an element of b to produce an element of a. And this gives us a way to go from an element of c to produce an element of b. So this might be useful. OK, and what we want is for all c and c, there is an element of a such that g follows f of a is c. So we want to show that g follows f is surjective. And Basically, can we combine these tools to get something like this? So let's try it. So let's start with this. And remember that what we want to produce is an element of A. And if we look back at our tools, what we said before is we can get from C to B this way, and then from B to A this way. So that gets us to A somehow. Let's write that down and see if it works. So since G is surjective, we can find an element of B such that G of B equals C. So this is our B. And then uh, since F is surjective, we can find an element in A such that f of A equals B. OK. So we found an element of A. That is what we wanted. We just need to check that it is the one that we're looking for. Does this satisfy our, uh, our condition? Um, so let's, let's just check. So then G follows F of A. How do we compute this? It's just G applied to F applied to A. And F of A is B. And G of B is C. And if we look at the two sides of this equation, that's exactly what we were going for. So it has worked perfectly, and that completes the proof. Um, thus, G follows F is surjective. Cool. So we tried some examples. Nothing went wrong, so we tried to prove it, and the proof worked. No problem there. 
And I want to point out also that, you know, depending on how comfortable you are with these ideas, you know, this has all just been introduced, so it, it's perfectly reasonable if you have no idea what's going on. But I want to point out that here is some statement, here is some problem that is not necessarily clear if it's true or false. You might have some suspicions, but maybe you have no idea how to prove it. But if you look at what we did here, and again, I'm not saying that this is easy, but what I'm saying is that these, um, these lessons that I'm trying to drill into your heads, using the definitions and applying the tools that you have, there was really nothing besides that, right? So we wrote down our definitions and we wrote down what that means in this situation. And I mean, okay, so this is the definition of surjective for F. This is the definition of surjective for G. And then this is the definition of uh, function composition, essentially. And you look that that's like essentially the entire argument uh, is just applying the definitions. So really it can take you quite a long way. That is one of the things that I want to emphasize. So, but let's move on. Let's do another example, which I think I don't need a new sheet for. Let's ask a related question, but slightly different. So another prove or disprove. Same setup as last time, but now if the composition is surjective, then F is surjective. So we want to prove or disprove this fact. And if we think about the example we did before, nothing really seemed to miss there. I mean, it wasn't for the same situation, but nonetheless, according to that example, um, there's no real reason to suspect otherwise. So let's do the same in this case, and let's just go ahead and try to prove it. So same definitions, I'm not going to write them down again. But what I will write down is what we're given is that G follows F is surjective. So for all, so let me write this down just so we don't forget, because I'm already forgetting. So this is F, this is G. So G follows F is a map from A to C. So for all C and C, what does it mean that this thing is surjective? For all C and C, there exists an A and A, such that G follows F of A equals C. And what we want, let's write down what this means as well. What we want is that for all, let's see, F is going from A to B. For all B in B, there exists an A in A, such that F of A equals B. Cool. Proof. Let's think about it in a similar way. So what we want is to go from B to A, get something that, that does this. And we know how to go from C to A using this tool. Um, and we know how to go from B to C by this, because we can apply G, right? So let's try that. So we start here and then go there and then go there. Let's see if this gets what we want. So let B and B. Um, then let C equal G of B. So this is an element of C, right? So since G follows F 
is surjective, we can find an element of A such that G equals F of A equals C. So now we have an element of A, which is what we wanted to produce. And let's check if it satisfies the thing we wanted to satisfy. Then um, F of A, can we say this is equal to B? This is what we want to check. And what do we know? So we know that um, G of B is C. And we know G of F of A is C. So there is this relationship between them. Does this imply that they're equal? In particular, we know that G of B equals G of F of A. So if you remember, um, what does it mean to say that F of A equals B? We would want to use the property that G is injective. So if G is injective, then F of A equals B. If not, all we know is that F of A and B are both pre-images of C. But it's not clear how to say that they're equal. So at this point, we are stuck. And we can kind of identify what is stopping us, which is that we want to say that G is injective, but we don't know that, right? If we look at our, our claim, there is no condition about G being injective. So let's try and look at an example. So can we come up with an example where so G is not injective, and then we're going to have some situation where at least one preimage of everything uh, in C gets hit by F, but not necessarily all of them. So let's try to write down an example like this. So A, B, C. So let's look at what happens if G is not injective, in particular. So let's say we have something like this, not injective, these ones are fine. Now, what is the obstruction? The obstruction is that f of a and b, uh, these things that we're trying to compare in this proof, might be different elements mapping to the same element. Oopsies. Um, so what was the obstruction? So f of a we definitely know is in the image because it's the image of a. But what if this thing is not? So then G follows F from A to C in this case. It's a little bit messy. G follows F will be this guy will go to here. And this guy will go to here, and this guy will go to here. So we get a situation where G follows F is surjective, but F is not surjective. 
because it misses this element here. So we have come up with a counterexample. The claim that we started with is false. If g follows f is surjective, uh, then it is not true that f has to be surjective. And the train of thought, the way we got there, was by starting by trying to prove it, and then identifying what prevented us from proving it, and then using that to inspire an example um, where it doesn't. You know, in fact, it doesn't work. So this is a, a fairly simple example still. Um, it may or may not have been obvious from the start what was going to happen. But I think it's a very good example of the kind of reasoning that you will find very helpful. Where if you don't know how to prove something, then work in both directions. And in both directions, see what is getting you stuck. And then see if you can use that as a tool to go the other direction. 